Turbine air systems. We're going to talk about this for a little bit. Realistically, when we talk about turbine air systems, we are differentiating this into two different categories. Number one, uh, air that is being used to service or power systems for the engine exclusively, and air that's being used for the sake of cooling the engine. Those are kind of the two areas we're going to break this into. So first, we're going to tackle air that's being used to service the engine by means of FOD prevention and anti-icing. So, quick reminder for those of you who may be struggling to remember, bleed air, right? We pull it out of our compressor section, we can pull it from different stages, we have higher and lower pressure bleed air sources, and we can use that to power a number of different systems on the aircraft and the engine itself. So in this case, as opposed to looking at bleed air systems used for things like starting and cabin pressurization and all that fun stuff, we're going to focus on bleed air systems that are powering portions of the engine or systems for the engine. So first up, we're going to take a look at vortex dissipators. Now, what you see in the background here is an example of what a vortex looks like while an engine is running on the ground. Now, because of the volume of air that's being moved through the engine and the flow pattern, what we can get is effectively a little tornado that can go all the way up from the ground and go straight into the engine. Now, obviously, with most modern turbofan engines, they're much lower to the ground and they are prone to developing these vortexes or vortices, especially at low speed and high power settings. So one way we can try to prevent this from causing FOD ingestion, either by means of water, things that are on the runway, gravel, you name it, we have our vortex dissipators. All that is, is taking a stream of high velocity bleed air off the compressor and it's shot through a small port is facing downward and forward on the front of the nose cowl and that's going to shoot straight down at the surface of the runway or the run-up area and that is going to break up this vortex that gets generated by uh, means of counteracting the airflow. Relatively simple system but it works effectively and it's also in most cases an automatic system so as opposed to having a switch in the cockpit that the flight crew has to actuate to turn on the vortex dissipators it's going to be linked in through a landing gear switch and is going to deploy automatically uh, effectively whenever it senses weight on wheels or whenever the landing gear are in the extended position but just a very simple technique to prevent FOD ingestion on the aircraft. Second we're going to look at is anti-icing. Now, something that's important to note about anti-ice is the system is designed to prevent icing as opposed to remove large accumulations of ice. So this is something that will be operated from the cockpit and is going to be used in conditions where icing is going to be suspect. So if they're flying into uh, an area where they suspect icing, they can engage the anti-ice system. Now, again, all this does is takes warm, high-pressure bleed air and it's going to duct it through a number of critical areas in the engine. Now, from the outside, you can see this system evidenced by the bare section on the front of the cowling on a turbofan engine. The reason it's bare is because we're flowing hot bleed air through that section through ducting on the inside, and we have these little piccolo tubes that are going to allow that hot bleed air to come into contact with the surface, the back surface of that nose cowl, and prevent ice from forming by means of keeping it warmer. On the other hand, we have a couple other areas where it may accumulate. The nose cone of the main fan section is prone to icing as well as the inlet guide vanes. So both of those are going to be uh, capable in most situations to a stream of hot bleed air that's going to help prevent ice from accumulating. Now, whenever this system is engaged, we are taking a fair amount of bleed air off the compressor. So uh, depending on the power output of the engine, it may be pretty noticeable when the anti-ice system is engaged, uh, looking at a couple different instruments in the cockpit, namely the tachometer, our exhaust gas temperature, and the engine pressure ratio will both give us a indication that the anti-ice system is in operation. Again, two simple systems that utilize bleed air to help create a more efficient and safer operating engine. Next up, we're going to talk about cooling. Cooling is a challenging one. Uh, we don't really think about this as much in the case of a turbine engine, but realistically, we talked about the amount of uh, heat that's lost uh, through reciprocating engines in a different lecture. When we look at uh, turbine engines, they are more efficient in terms of how they use the heat they generate. However, we also use about 75% of the air passing through that engine exclusively for cooling. 
in a number of different ways. So we're going to talk about that uh, just a little bit more. But as we break down where cooling is the most necessary in an engine, we'll say, uh, obviously as we go through the cold section of the engine or everything that is in front of the combustor, we're going to consider that the cold section. Even though we're starting to see temperature rises towards the exit of our high pressure compressor, they can start reaching in the 400 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe a little bit higher. That's still considered the cold section, largely just by comparison to the temperatures that we're seeing in the rest of the engine. Once we hit the combustors, we're going to see a sharp increase in temperature, and the hottest point of the engine is going to be right at the exit of the combustor as we enter into the turbine section. So the component of our engine that's going to see the highest uh, temperatures is going to be the turbine inlet guide vanes. And there's a couple different ways that we can deal with cooling, one of which, again, utilizes bleed air. There are some designs where either turbine inlet guide vanes or turbine blades themselves will be hollow and ported for bleed air to flow through. That bleed air flows through perforations on the outside surface of the vein or the blade, and it allows cooling air, relatively cooling air, to blow across and keep those temperatures down on the component itself while still maintaining high temperatures that we need to produce thrust and to recover with the turbine blades. Now, something that's interesting about this is when we see this system design, effectively, uh, we are running very, very high temperatures towards the aft side of the engine. Now, as we take a look at our combustor, we know our combustor is going to produce some very high temperatures as well. So we'll take a look here in just a minute how we can keep those temperatures down and prevent damage to the rest of the system. To address that though, we're gonna to need to revisit another concept from your original turbines class, and that is primary and secondary airflow. Now, primary airflow, if you'll remember, is any of the air that is passed through the actual core of the engine. Now, in the case of a turbojet engine, we really don't have a bypass, so it's all primary air. But in the instance of turbofans, be it low bypass or high bypass, we're going to have primary airflow that goes through the core of the engine, and then we're going to have secondary airflow that bypasses the core of the engine. So in most cases, when we talk about our cooling systems through the engine, we are not using our primary air to supplement cooling. We're using secondary airflow to supplement cooling throughout the engine. In the case of the uh, uh, combustor chamber or the combustion uh, liner walls, we're going to use ducted secondary air passed through the liner walls of that combustor to help keep the temperatures down so that we don't cause damage to the outside of the engine. A basic cooling system in this, visualizing how we use secondary air to augment this, this is very rudimentary. We'll talk about cooling zones in a minute, but this is very basic. Again, the same concept. You can see we have our cold section up front and we have our hot section in the back. Two things that we're going to use to help secondary air provide cooling throughout the engine is going to be a combination of ducts and seals to prevent heat from transferring and to uh, prevent uh, any back pressure, let's call it, of heat moving from the aft compartment forward. So up front we have our cool section which is separated by this fireproof seal that runs just in front of the combustion chamber. We have air that's being ducted from the inlet duct of the engine that's being passed all the way back and is used as a airflow augment to help keep the temperatures down between the outside of our exhaust cone and combustion chamber from the outside of the cowling. Now another thing to note is as we look at this, this design right here we would consider a ducted fan and the fact that our secondary airflow stream and our primary airflow stream right here are exiting through the same duct. This will look a little bit different maybe on a large turbofan engine which we'll see in a minute because it's not going to be what we consider a ducted fan. It's a unducted fan in the fact that the secondary air is going to exit independently of the primary air exiting from the engine exhaust. But as you can see, we have a very simple system. We take cool air up front and we're going to try to force it into the aft compartment while using a fireproof baffle or seal to prevent hot air from moving back up into the cold section. So here's where we look a little more complex and a little more complicated uh, with this system right here. So as we take a look at this on a turbofan engine, again you can see we have a separate exit for our secondary air that we see from the primary air that's coming through, and we're broken into a number of zones for cooling. So as we look at these different cooling zones, 
Let's talk about this in a little more detail. So in our three zone system for cooling, we're gonna break it into, well, three zones. First zone is gonna be our ram air that's gonna be cooling the cowling itself. The second zone is gonna be cooling our low pressure compressor area, while zone three is gonna be dealing with the hottest section cooling our high pressure compressor and our uh, combustion chamber and exhaust. So as we look at this, our zone one section, we'll use uh, blue here since it's a little bit uh, cooler looking. Uh, zone one is gonna be vented by ram air, which enters into this intermediary section between the actual inlet system and the cowling itself. So effectively, it's going to vent the fan cowling and keep the temperatures cool in between the actual engine casing and the external portion of the fan cowling. And of course, as we pick up speed, the effect of ram air is gonna be greater. So as a result, we have a pressure relief door over here that will open to expel excess pressure uh, to prevent any damage to the cowling from an overpressure situation. Next, as we take a look at our zone two cooling, zone two is gonna be warmer because we're looking at our low pressure compressor. We're also looking at fuel and oil lines that are running uh, to and from the engine. We keep those out of zone three because of the high temperatures in zone three. So zone two contains a lot of those components and where we get our source of cooling air is actually from the main fan duct over here. So our cooling air for zone two is a result of fan discharge, so we're actually starting to draw off of our secondary air now, and it's going to get forced into that compartment to provide cooling throughout the system. As we get the area cooled, it's going to flow through an exit door and will rejoin the secondary airstream and is exhausted through our secondary air exhaust outlet here on the outside of our engine core. Zone three, on the other hand, is our hottest section. That's where we're gonna have, as mentioned, our high pressure compressor, the uh, combustion chamber, the turbine cases, all those exciting things, as well as uh, a few additional servicing lines. So that area is going to be cooled uh, primarily through this inlet coming off of our lead air system pre-cooler. So that is where we get air injected into the system. And as a result, when it exits, it's designed to duct out around the turbine nozzle there and uh, actually helps to create a bit of a slipstream or vacuum effect pulling air through and helping it to exhaust. So we break it into three zones for different requirements of cooling to make sure that nothing gets over temped and we don't cause damage to any particular section. One other thing we'll talk about for cooling is when we're around the very very hot sections of the engine we have cooling blankets we can utilize that help to keep uh, separation uh, between the very very hot components of the engine and more damage prone areas due to temperature as well as to help uh, create an area for cooling air to flow so the way this is broken down we have our exhaust gas coming through let's say our combustion chamber or the nozzle and in between we have an engine insulation blanket so we have foil on the inside, we have layers of fiberglass and aluminum foil, and then we have this stainless steel shroud on the outside. Now this is just one cross section of uh, uh, construction here. There's a few different ways, but effectively this creates an insulating barrier so that we can create a very, very high temperature area, but we can keep a relatively low temperature area for cooling air to flow through and help to keep the outer engine compartment from receiving any damage due to the radiated heat. It also helps to protect the engine casing from fuel, oil, and anything else that uh, may drip down onto it due to leaks, which obviously over time, as those leak onto engine components and the high temperatures, they could cause damage over time uh, through a number of different means. So that helps to protect the engine as well as the surrounding structure from very high outlet temperatures. Now you're probably wondering why we're looking at the Provost to talk about modern jet engines. And granted, I will, I will concede that it is not particularly modern. However, even though it smells kind of funny and it's a little old, we can still learn a lot from it, just like your instructor. Now, that being said, we're going to take a look at a couple features on this about uh, engine cooling on turbine engines. So let's take a little bit of a closer look. Over at our axis hatch here, we're talking a little bit about insulation blankets on turbine engines, it can be used to protect other areas from heat generated by the engine itself, and it can also protect the casing of the engine from things like fuel and oil being spilled onto it. So as you take a look in here, you can see this 
corrugated aluminum foil looking material and this is actually wrapped around the turbine housing section of this engine and it's doing exactly uh, what we would talk about is it is protecting the casing and it is protecting some of these more delicate structure elements around the engine from becoming damaged due to the uh, very high temperatures that are produced going through the turbine section. Now that's only one component though. We have a jet pipe that goes all the way down to the end of the aircraft here but this insulation blanket is only one part of the mystery. Another major component to how we're cooling this is the airflow around the jet engine. And to see how that works, we're gonna walk over to the other side real quick. Over on the other side of this uh, aircraft, you can see it on this side kind of as well, but you can get a better view on this side. Up here on the top of the turtle deck, so this access panel that we have right up at the top, you can see just a little scoop that's sitting on top of that access panel with the uh, undone fasteners. Now there's two scoops on either side and what those do is they gather airflow from the airstream as the aircraft is in operation and draw it into the engine compartment. Now as we go back around to the back side, you'll see why this is so cool. I also have a good example of a uh, split entry duct over here two inlets feeding one compressor section. As we go back, we take a look at the stinger section where the uh, exhaust nozzle is for this engine. You'll notice, if you look very carefully, try to get in a little bit closer. If you look very carefully, you can see that there's a gap around this jet pipe. Not a big gap, but enough of a gap around the jet pipe. What that is, is calibrated to such a distance so that it helps to promote cooling airflow. So effectively, we create kind of a vacuum running through the tail end of this aircraft. The heat being exhausted helps promote airflow from those scoops up at the front of the aircraft all the way back around the jet pipe and exiting the aircraft back here. So what that does is it helps to provide a good source of cooling airflow that helps keep the temperatures down as well. And then speaking of temperatures, right in here you can see our exhaust gas temperature probes our EGT probes, if we get a little bit closer. You can see our EGT probes right here in the jet pipe measuring our exhaust gas temperature. 